We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all, all united. united. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you're joining us, whether it's here physically at the IGF in Katowice, Poland, or virtually online. We are very proud to have you today at the launch of the Multi-Stakeholder Network for Capacity Building, and we're grateful to all of you for joining us today. As part of the formal launch of this Capacity Building Network, we are going to hear from some of the stakeholders themselves who are leaders in different ways of digital capacity building as part of our global effort to have more coordinated, coherent global digital capacity building. Time allowing, we will also have a brief open discussion and question and answer. So to participate in the question and answer, please submit questions online through the Zoom chat. I'll ask our online moderators to share some of these questions in the end, which I'll ask, and we'll ask our distinguished speakers and panelists to respond. If you're in person, please indicate here in the room if you'd like to also take the floor. With that in mind, let's start with our welcoming remarks by Ms. Maria Francesca Spatolisano, Assistant Secretary General and Officer in Charge of the Secretary General's um, Office of the Secretary General's Envoy on Technology here at the United Nations and live as well at this, the 16th Internet Governance Forum. Assistant Secretary General Spatolisano, please. Thank you, Yuping, and hello, everyone. Morning, afternoon, and evening, wherever you are. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to our session on strengthening global capacity development, organized indeed by the Office of the Secretary General Envoy on Technology, together with the ITU, the International Telecommunication Union, and UNDP, the UN Development Program. As COVID-19 changes and challenges the world, the importance of building capacity for digital transformation has become ever more urgent. Working and learning are no longer the same. We all have experienced that we went online. Uh, efforts uh, to sustain education, health, jobs, and economy during the COVID-19 pandemic suggest new ways that we can and we must reimagine our society for a post-pandemic world with digital technologies pervasively. But throughout the pandemic, we have also witnessed how global inequalities can be exacerbated by the digital divide, which is not only due to a lack of connectivity, but also gaps in building digital capacity. This divides would only worsen between and among countries if the gaps between the digital have and the have-nots are not addressed. Simply having connectivity is not enough. Underserved populations will need digital skills, knowledge skills, literacy, capacity to fully and meaningfully leverage the transformational power of digital technologies in their lives. The Secretary General's roadmap for digital cooperation thus lays out concrete action-oriented steps for narrowing the digital divides and strengthening global digital capacity building. This is urgently needed, in particular to achieve also the sustainable development goals and build the open, free, and secure digital future for all envisioned in the Global Digital Compact to come in September next year. But today, in fulfillment of one of the roadmap's recommendations, we are very pleased to announce the launch of our multi-stakeholder network on digital capacity development, or MSN for brevity, through dedicated efforts by ITU and UNDP, I really have to give them uh, tribute. The co-champions of our roundtable on digital capacity building, we have been engaging a broad range of cross-sector stakeholders to better understand the landscape of digital capacity initiatives 
and then to design the multi-stakeholder network on digital capacity development. The network builds on an existing online database featuring over 100 digital capacity development providers and will also contain additional information on global resources presented in a user-friendly uh, format. Most importantly, it will provide a, what we call a clearinghouse function powered by a new ITU-UNDP joint facility to help direct specific requests for support to potential providers of digital capacity building initiatives, training, but not only, and you will hear all the details in a minute. I would like to invite you all to join our efforts as we work to expand the MSN to provide more tailored and impact-oriented digital capacity building support for all. Let me end by thanking again and congratulating ITU and UNDP and the others who have already confirmed their readiness to be part of this network so that we can collectively join hands with all those users we wish will benefit from this platform. I thank you. Thank you so much, ASG Spatulisano. We now call upon Ms. Doreen Bogdan-Martin, Director of the Telecommunication Development Bureau at ITU. Thank you so much, uh, Yu Ping, Assistant Secretary General. It's, um, it's great to be here. Uh, and to welcome you to this session on strengthening global digital capacity development and to share a bit more with this community on the multi-stakeholder network on digital capacity development. I think uh, also Yu Ping, we have had this morning, yesterday, and of course Monday on day zero, opportunities to dive into the different barriers around connectivity from the affordability piece the um, trust piece, the security piece, the gender piece, the youth piece. And now we're gonna dive into something that, that we think will help when we talk about um, the capacity, the digital capacity gap. Um, so this multi-stakeholder network is something that was built actually with many of you, again, very grateful that uh, so many of you have joined us in, in the process. The network is an outcome of the Digital Cooperation Roadmap. Uh, we've co-championed this exercise with our partners, uh, UNDP, and of course, Robert Opp is, is here with us as well today. And its intention is really to, uh, as part of the, the roadmap follow-up, to implement the key actions around capacity building uh, that were, were annotated in the Digital Cooperation Roadmap. Um, New data, and I've mentioned this a couple times this week, but um, I think everyone has followed the data that we launched last week about this connectivity boost that was caused by COVID that brought an additional 800 million more people online. Uh, and I, I've been focusing on the, the sort of bad news piece that 2.9 billion remain totally offline, that they've never ever used the internet. And of course, within that, the biggest challenge is with least developed countries in particular, where the vast connectivity divide remains with almost, it's about one in four people connected. And of course, in a handful of countries, we see um, penetration rates where we have one in 10 people actually connected. So much work to be done in that space. And of course, the majority of those that we consider digitally excluded actually face formidable challenges in capacity development. So from the lack of digital literacy, digital skills, even awareness of the, 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 uh, the many opportunities that the internet provides. So of course, changing this picture demands innovation, innovative new ways of working, and of course, concerted efforts on many fronts. I think everyone has something unique and valuable to bring to the table. And that's why uh, we have taken this approach to integrate a wide range of perspectives and try to pool our strengths. Uh, by doing so, we believe that we can empower ourselves to truly make a difference. 
This principle has been central to our work with the multi-stakeholder um, roundtable approach, uh, supported, as I mentioned, by UNDP and, of course, the, the Office of, uh, of the Tech Envoy. Leveraging our respective know-how and networks, we put together this database, as the ASG just mentioned, of different training providers from around the globe. We have a focus on nine core areas, nine focus areas. And of course, they're all centered around digital transformation, sustainable digital transformation. Uh, and as well, we have hundreds of digital capacity development resources. Uh, with the help of our multi-stakeholder network members, we will continue to expand this database uh, so that those looking for digital capacity development training can rapidly identify the resources that are available and then match them to, to, to their needs. We'll also be creating new resources because we want to be able to support groups that might still be underserved. Uh, and, and our efforts, of course, can only benefit from a my, more diverse um, range of, of, of voices. So if you'd like to contribute your own insights, your experiences, or your services, we would warmly invite you to do so. Uh, my colleague Caroline can, can post the link uh, in, the, in the chat. Um, ladies and gentlemen, so yesterday in the opening ceremony, the UNSG reinforced the messages of the common agenda placing strong emphasis on global cooperation and on reinvigorating efforts to build an inclusive digital future for all. Capacity development is a critical piece of ensuring an inclusive digital future. And with your support and participation, the multi-stakeholder network will serve as a key building block in strategies and initiatives to leverage the power of digital so that we can all make good on our pledge to leave no one behind. So thanks very much for joining us. And with that, Yuping, I hand back to you. Over, thank you. Thank you so much, Doreen. And indeed, us at the Tech Envoy Office have been so grateful to have you and ITU as our strong partners in this. Now, let me turn to our other champion and close partner, UNDP, where, which is represented by Robert Opp, Chief Digital Officer. Thank you so much, uh, Yu Ping, and uh, good afternoon, good morning to everybody. Uh, it is a pleasure to be with you today and welcome you to the launch of this multi-stakeholder network for digital capacity building. Uh, it's been a great journey that we've been on together with our co-champions, uh, ITU, Doreen, thank you for your leadership, um, as well as the support and leadership of the UN Tech Envoys so, uh, Office. So thank you, Francesca and Yu Ping for, for that. I think that we can safely say that the demand for digital capacity building has never been higher. And across our uh, country, country office network of about 170 countries and territories, um, we are seeing a huge demand for capacity building. And in fact, we, we have digital champions in, in all of those offices. And we, we recently surveyed them on the needs that they see among our partner uh, government, um, our, our partner governments and capacity came back really near the top. Um, we know that the challenges around digital capacity building are highly varied between countries and even within countries. We have challenges of a lack of content in local languages. Um, we need to understand specific needs of certain populations. Um, Doreen mentioned uh, the, the, the gender digital divide, youth, affordability is an issue. And this is precisely why we need a multi-stakeholder approach to address the problem, because we can bring different perspectives, different pockets of expertise, different geographic reach, specific capacities, and all of this to be able to support people uh, in a timely and agile way. We know that collaboration can make our work better. And in UNDP, we're, we're really pleased to collaborate um, with ITU globally, but also regionally, as we work together on a small island and developing state uh, project on e-learning. We're in Mauritania. We collaborate with the e-governance academy of the, the government of Estonia. We work together with the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development uh, on a Skills for an Inclusive Future initiative, which is about how do we amplify private sector engagement in digital skills development. And we're really pleased to also have established, as part of this roundtable process, a joint facility for global digital capacity building together with ITU. 
And that joint facility is really uh, initially at least about supporting the work of the multi-stakeholder network and then looking at as needs emerge, how do we build new joint capacity building offers um, that are informed by what the multi-stakeholder network is identifying in terms of needs and gaps. And just before I close, I'd like to take this opportunity really to, to thank and express our gratitude to the, the over 30 organizations that participated in the roundtable process uh, over the last 18 months-ish. Um, we really could not have done any of this without you. Um, a lot of these partners have already expressed their commitment to becoming members of the network, and we invite all other organizations as well who are interested to join the effort. Um, so with that, uh, Yuping, I'll turn back over to you and really look forward to the conversation from our special guest today. Thank you so much, Rob. And as we mentioned at the start of the meeting, it's very important to hear from those stakeholders that are directly involved in various ways of actually bringing digital capacity building to the ground. So that being said, let me first kick off by turning to Mr. Anir Chaudhry, the policy advisor for A2I Bangladesh. Anir, are you on the line? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me properly? Yes, we can. It's perfect. Mm -hmm. So let's yeah, start with you then. And let me ask for your views on how your initiative, A2I, has managed to build innovation capacity among governments and how you think that the MSM that we are launching today can support governments in building digital capacity. Thank you, Ping. Uh, really glad to be here. Uh, wish I could be there in person, but uh, good to see many familiar faces. Obviously, Robert Top, uh, Doreen, good to see you here. Uh, the support that we've had from uh, UNDP since the beginning of A2I uh, has been tremendous because uh, UNDP actually started A2I, the Prime Minister's office, about 14 years ago. Uh, uh, and then the Digital Bangladesh Clarion call from Prime Minister uh, made A2I sort of the flagship uh, steering uh, program for building digital Bangladesh. And capacity building was really at the heart of it. Uh, capacity building of the government officials. ITU has played a very important role in that uh, in two ways. One, in terms of uh, strategically guiding the government uh, to develop connectivity across the entire country. And second is inspiring many of the initiatives uh, that we have launched uh, over the years uh, with the WISIS awards. So thank you, Doreen, for the encouragement over the years. Uh, since 2014, I think we've had uh, multiple awards every year. Thank you for that. So ITU and UNDP have been at the forefront of what we have done in Bangladesh. So I should probably mention that Bangladesh, when we started out, really was not a digital country. In 2007, we had less than 1% internet connectivity. Uh, in terms of digital services, we had less than 10. Uh, now we have over 1,500. And in terms of access to digital services, uh, that was also lacking because obviously internet penetration was less than 1% and we had no assisted access. So what we did uh, with uh, the then UNDP administrator, Helen Clark, was visiting Bangladesh in 2010, we launched uh, at that time 4,500 uh, rural, uh, <clears throat> what, what are called digital centers, which are basically the bridge between analog citizens and digital world of service. So they could go there and access services by paying a small fee. These centers, uh, which number now in 8,000 plus, are within a few kilometers of walking distance in almost every citizen country, except for some hilly areas and coastal areas. Uh, so in terms of capacity development, these digital centers actually create a, a fertile ground for innovation because uh, ministries and directorates can decentralize their services to these digital centers. We have nearly about 300 services that are delivered from these digital centers. Over the last 10, 11 years, we have uh, delivered 750 million services from these digital centers. So it's a large number of services that we have developed from, delivered from these digital centers. Every month, about 6 million people visit these centers. So that's one capacity development of the, of the civil service that they can decentralize their services to the digital centers. So we call these digital centers, part of our policy Legos. Essentially, these are components of innovation that are stitched together to build new innovation. I'll give you a couple more other examples. So there, there is a decision support system within the government, which is now being used by about 11,000 offices. 
And uh, the way this works is uh, each ministry can build their innovation on top of this digital support. So the, this gives you a foundational stack on which to build new services. And uh, several hundred services have been built on top of this, uh, which is called e-filing. We also have a national portal, uh, which now covers about 50,000 offices of the government. Again, another building block that is used by different uh, uh, offices to uh, build new digital <coughs> services. The last two things I would like to point out is that from the point of assisted access, from the point of view of uh, building these uh, digital uh, building blocks and creating new service on top of it, uh, we're also focusing on what is called empathy training, which is a design thinking process for thousands of civil servants who actually go through a citizen's view of service delivery process. They actually go through a citizen's journey and understand what is not working for citizens and they actually redesign services based on that. They simplify services. We have actually had many ministries simplify uh, about 700 plus services uh, before they digitize them. So a combination of these policy Legos, the assisted access, the digital centers, and the capacity development process that we have uh, within the government in terms of understanding citizens' perspective, uh, combining these policy Legos and creating new innovations is the, the whole innovation ecosystem innovation culture nurture in the last 12, 13 years. And that's where I, UNDP and ITU have played a very, very important role. In terms of MSN that is being launched today, I think uh, some of the lessons that we have learned over the years could potentially uh, serve as uh, uh, probably starting points or further lessons for other countries. But at the same time, Bangladesh is always looking for lessons from other countries instead of reinventing the wheel. So we're really looking forward to this network and uh, learning uh, from uh, members of this network, uh, new innovations, new approaches to building that culture of innovation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anir. And I think that is really a good example of how ITU and UNDP expertise can really serve countries on the ground and directly. We now turn to Bjorn Richter, who is the head of sector programming at GIZ, who is joining us online. Bjorn, I see you online. Um, GIZ has established, for instance, um, a learning platform, Atingi, as part of the global project Africa Cloud to provide digital skill trainings. How do you see opportunities for partnership to scale this work perhaps via the MSM? Bjorn? Yes, um, thank you very much for having us and thanks for the, uh, the great opportunity to also uh, join the MSN community um, as we, as Rob and Doreen already laid down, I think it's a, it's a great uh, partnership that uh, grows by sharing it. And um, so uh, it's a lot in, when it comes to digital transformation, I think we have to appreciate that um, we can only answer the, um, the, the efforts or the, uh, the, 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 the challenges uh, in, a, in a joint manner and rather not in a separate manner. So um, just wanted to, 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 to contribute to this one. Um, looking um, precisely uh, in the area what Rob said, um, we have um, uh, 32 countries where we uh, um, where we have uh, so-called digital transformation centers as advisory uh, bodies um, to the digital ministers and to regulatory authorities up and running. And what we see um, between um, Mexico, Indonesia, but also the, um, the core on the African soil between Niger, Nigeria, and Kenya, you know, very diverse countries, what we see is um, that huge um, uh, 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 new uh, connectivity that is coming in because of the, um, uh, of the, of the COVID crisis. We see a lot of opportunities um, and we see uh, a big question you know how to um, champion that one um, for a human-centric approach obviously that is important for us but also what we would say is the use of usage yeah so while the uh, the connectivity is now with a lot of partners being uh, been been finally tackled uh, particularly here the world bank and the de 4 a program but also uh, the european commission now coming on board and and obviously the private sector that is very much welcomed and needed um, we see that uh, the use of usage um, to create um, what we call a data economy, to create a real um, digital sovereign data economy is, is important. Uh, and we also see um, that it's important to get governmental services digitized um, to get better um, and more services directly to, to citizens. What I think um, was presented also yesterday with the, with the GovSec initiatives, where we think the, the digital um, uh, public goods should be strengthened. Um, and looking into this one is uh, 
ju just absolutely uh, uh, is uh, essential to work together on capacity development to strengthen um, uh, not only the uh, regulatory authorities, but also the digital ecosystem partners. Uh, so we do this um, with um, two examples um, based on our Atingi learning platform that uh, we reached out to 2 million people already. It's a global platform, but that is feeding out in different formats. Um, and there are the um, global platform has a as a co contribution to the so-called Smart Africa Digital Academy, where I think my uh, the colleague uh, Calvin um, is in the call from Smart Africa and will uh, definitely um, uh, uh, inform you more about this one. Uh, for us, it was really an incredible piece of work um, to work uh, with the African regulators uh, on issues like artificial intelligence, but also on demystifying uh, digital development uh, for rural um, areas. What Anir just laid out, yeah, particular the uh, to bridge um, the digital the digital capacity development to officers in the rural areas, I think was uh, very well perceived in, in Rwanda and uh, could be something that uh, could also be potentially scaled in other countries. And obviously, it's important um, to come with uh, with partners from the industry, like um, like partners from IBM, um, uh, but also from SAP, from Orange, um, and to see how there are particular skills um, that you need to understand uh, if you want to uh, work in the digital uh, sector uh, itself. So always on an open source and open educational platform, not driven by the industry, but actually facilitating the requirements and making sure the authorities do have the capacity to, uh, to do their job for, for, for a human-centric approach. When it comes to skills development, uh, we also see that the Atingi learning platform that you mentioned um, has reached the 2 million people. Um, how uh, was that possible? basically with new partnerships. Yeah? And here, I think our partnership with, with UNICEF um, and the Austrian uh, Development Agency and uh, quite some startups on the African uh, soil are kicking in uh, what we call the YOMA project, which is basically um, developing uh, young uh, yeah. people uh, with a career perspective. So yeah, thanks see. a lot. Yeah. I didn't mean to cut you off, and I'm so sorry. And, and all the work that you're talking about is terribly important. We just have a number of other speakers. And here, I also really want to pick up on your point about open source and the Giz and GovShack initiative, where I believe ITU is also a partner. We also have a have Kate from Dial to also speak on the importance of that. So thank you so much for that perspective. And we really do look forward to leveraging on your work and Giz's very important role as part of the network. Now, let me turn to Teresa. Um, for Teresa, Horace Jova, who is Director of Project Development and Partnerships at Diplo Foundation and Geneva Internet Platform. Teresa, Diplo and the Geneva Internet Platform have actually been working in this area of um, supporting small and developing countries through targeted trainings in digital policy for quite a while. Where do you see the biggest challenges based on your experiences and how do you think the multi-stakeholder network can address some of these? Well, thank you very much, Yu Ping, and thank you definitely to session organizers for allowing me to be part of this conversation. So um, I will prefer not to talk about Diplo and our work, but maybe um, just to share some inputs about how I see uh, these efforts. So uh, first of all, I really wanted to congratulate uh, the champions that uh, you have managed uh, to certainly kind of raise the political attention that was given to capacity building and capacity development uh, in digital policy, especially in the framework of the roadmap uh, for digital cooperation. So, so that's, that's excellent. Now I will be a little bit more uh, frank. So I think that creating a database, which is a starting point, as we have heard, that is trying kind of to match the demand and supply, it's a, it's a very important uh, endeavor. However, I am convinced that this is simply not enough. This will not make the cut in uh, solving or contributing uh, to, uh, to having less issues that we are experiencing in uh, digital uh, capacity building. The roadmap provided kind of a framework that we should create a broad multi-stakeholder network that should be promoting holistic, inclusive uh, approaches uh, to digital capacity building for sustainable development. We are not there yet, uh, I am afraid. Now, why uh, do I think it, and this is really based on the experience that Diplo has made in providing capacity building programs for developing countries uh, in particular. These countries do not have sufficient capacity to meaningfully involve 
or get included in the global uh, policy processes. And uh, to change this, they need very targeted and tailored support. They need individualized guidance in this respect, in the process. And these challenges will not be solved that the kind of demand and supply will be matched. It will not be solved by uh, them using a database and knowing who are the providers of possible capacity building programs uh, in their area. So um, that's one point. Another point I would like to raise at, is that this is also not the first effort or attempt uh, to kind of map uh, capacity building. And um, I would really appreciate, and I can see even in the lineup of this session that this is the case, that uh, there are more stakeholders that have experience with this matchmaking or clearinghouse uh, function that are really, really involved in this exercise and that we built on their expertise. Uh, one example uh, can definitely be uh, the Global Forum on, on a Cyber uh, Expertise. So like being very practical, what would I suggest we do next, you know, after, after creating uh, this first step? is to really uh, take this as an only starting point because much more uh, need to be, needs to be done. It would be excellent if the political of weight of the, of the UN uh, can be really used in trying to mobilize more resources for capacity building support, because this will be the problem for many developing countries. And we do need to talk about resources for capacity building programs. I would also again strongly suggest to work with experienced providers who can provide neutral and tailored uh, capacity building programs. And also I would like to urge us to really think about impact uh, that each, uh, these programs are having, because very often uh, kind of the impact uh, is bigger if we work on a smaller scale and do not just worry about, uh, about big numbers, let's say of individuals uh, trained. So with this, I will probably stop. Sorry to be a little bit more provocative, but I hope this will contribute to good discussion at the end of the session. Thank you, Yuping, over to you. I have to say that kind of candor and honesty is what we really need to make real progress and that you are right. The roadmap was a start. The network itself is a start of a process that's much bigger and larger than all of us. But it is precisely that using the convening power of the United Nations, ITU and UNDP and all of you together that we will make that kind of progress and answer those questions and conundrums that you yourself have raised. Our next speaker is going to be Calvin Nangui, who is Project Manager for Skills Development and Capacity Building at Smart Africa, also joining us online. Smart Africa, Calvin, has launched the Smart Africa Digital Academy. What critical skills gaps does SADA address and how? And what demands for capacity building are you seeing in the African region? And how do you think we at the United Nations and through the MSN could be useful in further scaling up the work and the job offer, the offers that you are making through SADA? Kelvin, please. You're muted. Sorry about that. Yeah. So thank you very much for the opportunity to provide to Smart Africa to join the MSN and we congratulate the ITU and UNDP uh, for this commendable roadmap. Africa is the world's second most populous continent after Asia with more than 1.3 billion people and with the youngest population among all the continent. So our challenge is that by 2030, 230 million jobs available to the, uh, to, young, I mean, to the young generation of today will require digital skills. And we need to ensure quality jobs leveraging on the continent's useful demography uh, to be one of our game changers in Africa. So SADA understood that the Smart Digital Academy is to, was launched as a coalition of stakeholders, which included the two member states, the private sector, international organization, training providers, academics, and more. So the aim of the coalition is to curb digital divide uh, skills required to enable citizens to thrive in a digital economy. So we do this by promoting and implementing initiatives in five essential domains, namely the policy and decision makers, where we empower leaders to make informed policies, advance ICT mastery, professionals and entrepreneurs, academics and civics. And finally, we need to empower citizens to gain the basic literacy in an inclusive manner. So how do we then go about you know, benefiting from the MS, uh, MSN network as a move on? But I mentioned, SADA is a multi-stakeholder coalition by, owned by each member state to curb the digital gap in Africa. So we rely, we rely on the power of collaboration 
in partnership to define a sustainable environment where best practices are shared, successful initiatives are promoted, and impactful projects are scaled. For instance, we had a joint initiative with ITU to develop a digital innovation ecosystem to build entrepreneurial communities and competitive ICT industry for job creation. We also had a collaboration with BMZ GIZ through the Atingi Initiative to avail to citizens access to innovative digital knowledge and lifelong learning opportunities. We, I, I will not mention the involvement on the UN Giga project where we bridge the rural, rural teachers skill gap uh, to, in the connected schools that are provided. We also have the, we joined the GFC uh, uh, forum to strengthen cyber capacity and expertise within South Africa member state countries. Uh, we also had a collaboration with the World Bank and BMZ to prepare our government to adopt agile regulation principles and become transformative uh, into the digital transformation process. And finally, we have partnership with tech giants such as Intel, Google, Microsoft, Cisco to strengthen the understanding uh, of emerging technology trends by our policy and decision makers uh, to take informative uh, you know, policies. So in a nutshell, CIDA supports the MSN objective by promoting scaled up and coordinated efforts to develop the African continent digital capacity. So this is what we have to say in a nutshell over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Calvin. Um, and also in reference, I think, to not just Calvin's work and in terms of a network, but also something that was already previously mentioned, Chris Painter, who is president of the Global Forum and Cyber Expertise, I think Teresa had also mentioned the GFC as well. Chris, how do you think that the MSM can actually help work with the GFC, which has been providing cyber security advice to many countries and has really a long track record. Do you see, for instance, potentially a role being that neutral partner that Teresa had mentioned before? What can the MSN do to amplify the good work that GFC is already doing? Yeah, and, and let me say first, uh, I think the MSN is an important effort. I often say, uh, and we've heard this earlier in this program too, from the Assistant Secretary and from Doreen, that that you know, cyber capacity building to me, or just capacity building generally, is foundational to all the other good things we're trying to achieve in cyberspace, and also combating the bad things we see. So it's really critically important. And it hasn't, I think, received the level of resources or political attention it needs. And that goes to Teresa's comments. Um, I, speaking with my GFC head on, you know, the, the Global Forum of Cyber Expertise, as you mentioned, was created now about six years ago, almost seven years ago in 2015. So it's a relatively mature operation that's really focusing on the cybersecurity part of this issue, cybersecurity and cybercrime, and enhancing capacity building, promoting capacity building, providing tools to the community, creating a community, and doing that, that um, clearinghouse function, that's one of our core functions, to match countries who need help with an, a, a range of multi-stakeholder entities who provide it. Uh, it's really built on the notion that capacity building particularly cyber capacity building, which is you know, one part, an important part, but one small part of the larger digital capacity building you're talking about, requires a flexible approach and a diverse ecosystem that mobilizes multi-stakeholder engagement from the beginning. Uh, and, and that's been affirmed in our founding document, something called the Delhi Communique. We now have 154 members and partners, including 55 UN member states and a number of UN bodies, including we've worked with the ITU and UNDP as well. Uh, so we have built, we've been spending our time building and sustaining this dynamic capacity building ecosystem that includes tools designed for and beyond the community. So we have the community, but we also work beyond the community. Uh, so we, for instance, administer the Sybil portal, uh, which is a capacity building um, knowledge portal, which I think is something that should be cross-linked between the work that you're doing, uh, which makes it easy for folks, and it's available to everyone, to access information. I put the link in the, in the chat. Uh, access information on projects, resources, events, data provided by the network, and also research projects that have been uh, where we've looked at gaps uh, that, are, that exist and tried to fill those gaps. Um, we also have other initiatives and projects that are driven by the network to really help with capacity building efforts. And as I said, one, one of the most important things is just creating this community, identifying those gaps, and then uh, and then looking for the needs. We've shifted to 
what we call a more demand-driven approach and a more regional approach. So we're simply not saying what we think people need, but asking them, which is critically important, what they need. So that that's an important part of it. And I must say, you know, my experience with the clearinghouse is it is far more intensive, resource intensive than simply uh, creating a website. That you 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 know, when we have people come to us, countries come to us, it requires a lot of work figuring out what they really need, what else they might need, and then putting together those resources to help them. And so that that takes a lot of time in each case. Now, as, as we go into the future, and I think this is where there's certainly a lot of uh, opportunities for collaboration, one thing that's a priority for us in 2022 is to strengthen the link between digital development and cybersecurity capacity building. Um, this is one of the aims. We're planning on having a high-level conference uh, on cyber capacity building in 2022, uh, in the fall of 2022, that's being co-hosted by the GFC, the World Bank, the Cyber Peace Institute, and the World Economic Forum, but it's going to be very inclusive, uh, and, and right now we'll, we're planning on having that at the World Bank, and so that'll be an important thing, but what I found is the development community and the cyber security community are often different animals and don't talk to each other as much, and I know I've talked to many of you about that before. In fact, we initiated a report called Integrating Cyber Capacity Building into the Digital Development Agenda, uh, with important recommendations. This just was released last week at our annual meeting, including pathways to bridge the development community to the cybersecurity capacity building community, which I think will make us all stronger. So that's another area of collaboration. And I should say that that was an effort we did and, and worked with the UNODP, UNDP closely on that. So as I look at this overall issue and to your question, it's important to connect the MSN with the GFC network, explore areas of cooperation and collaboration. And obviously, because we have limited resources in this space, uh, avoid reinventing the wheel and duplication, as others said. So I think those are things we can do. Uh, we have a mature system that I think help, can, can work with the MSN, and we look forward to doing that in the future. But also, based on our experiences, helping you uh, think about some of the challenges that we've seen as we've uh, been working in this space for the last seven years and, and going forward. We Again, this is a critical area. Thank you so much, Chris. And certainly like all the other stakeholders, we'll be counting your expertise and your experience in guiding us to make sure that the MSN has maximum impact. And really, as Theresa had mentioned before, brings the political attention and the resources that this urgent issue really requires. Our last panelist is going to be Kate Wilson, CEO of the General Impact Alliance Dial, a close partner for us at the Tech Envoy office and really a key part of our work on something that a lot of you had also mentioned and is actually a round table that we work on as well in fulfillment of the Secretary General's roadmap, the area of digital public goods. Kate, the question that we have for you is that you are now working with a range of countries on accelerating their digital transformation. What do you see as the key challenges related to digital capacity? And if you could choose one indicator of success for the MSM, what would it be? And how would we really look at progress going forward? Thank you so much. Um, I really wanna thank uh, the Assistant Secretary General, um, you yourself, Yu Ping, Robert and Doreen for your leadership. I think that your efforts to actually pull together all of these capacity efforts across all the partners who are working on this um, is so critical. And as Teresa said, it's it's not enough, but it's an excellent place to start. And I know that we have a lot more to do together. Um, I wanted to, you know, king off of your question, but also pick up on some of the comments that have been made by colleagues. Um, sort of point out, I think, some areas where, you know, we talk about capacity as this quite large thing, but I think that there's some very specific types of capacity, some of which, you know, Chris just touched on in terms of cyber, or has been touched on in terms of direct uh, logical support. But let's talk about what are countries really struggling with on the ground. We actually have a team who just left Sierra Leone yesterday, uh, and they were last week leading um, work with the government to do training in the principles for digital development, which is a set of heuristics, um, which has been agreed to by 300 organizations across uh, the global development system. And they did that to underpin how they were then going to work on their enterprise architecture. And that work done in partnership with our colleagues at Smart Africa and close partners there, and the ministry uh, in the Ministry of ICT in Sierra Leone, really sort of highlights you know, what countries are looking for. So first, they're thinking about, you know, how do I help create better digital choosers? How am I identifying what 
information I should be doing? What are some best practices that are common across technology? And then how do I underpin that with the deep training and expertise in setting out the systems that are really going to guide kind of our whole of government or whole of society approach? And that ties in, um, as Bjorn said, to some of the GovStack initiative and work that we're doing. So after they've started to choose and understand that, they then need to be able to identify where that technology or those building blocks fit. And one of the uh, places that we're then emphasizing is sort of the catalog of proven solutions, which allows people to highlight what and identify what technology already exists so they can easily find it. And I'm pleased to say that in cooperation with the ITU and UNDP, we're actually linking the MSN network, this capacity building, with the technology building blocks themselves so that you can both find what you're looking for, but then also find people who can help link that. And I think that's a critical combination between. The third thing that I think countries are really looking for is, um, as many of the speakers have highlighted, is all the things on the soft side. When I've worked with countries, they've generally have asked me for, you know, can you help me? I know perfectly well how to identify my, you know, information systems. I need help advocating for policy change. I need help with advocating for new financing for capacity. I need help with building out my middle management track of people. And so we sometimes use capacity as this broad thing and teaching people how to use the technology. When in reality, we often have amazing technologists on the ground who are already there who really need to understand how do I do policy advocacy? How do I do financing advocacy? How do I mobilize the resources to make sure that this effort lasts? And so I think as we, begin this journey together with the launch of the MSN roadmap that we really start to do that. So your question was directly, how do we think about an indicator or metrics for that? So my main indicator would be that anyone anywhere in the world who is beginning to identify new information systems for their governments um, or for their societies as a whole actually has access to uh, the technology products that are easily available, the capacity to use them, and through GovStack, hopefully has the reference implementations to identify how to do this more effectively and efficiently. A little bit more than one indicator, but hopefully that's okay. Thanks. Ambitious, Kate, but it's definitely a goal to aspire towards. Thank you again, Kate. Um, we now have some time for questions and answers. And I'd like to turn to the audience both here in person as well as online as well. Maybe I can start with the colleagues that are here joining us live from Hatuichi. And I see here somebody in the room. If you could also introduce yourself so that. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Abi Shakwira. I work for, for UNDP Cairo, uh, Egypt Cairo office. Um, and congratulations for launching the MSN. And I actually uh, second Teresa's opinion that uh, the um, uh, support provided by MSN has to be uh, country specific. Uh, for example, in Egypt, we are developing a platform that's uh, providing career advisory slash capacity building to youth. So we advise youth on which kind of training and certificates they need to take to pursue a specific career. Uh, this platform is actually uh, recently being linked to uh, an initiative, a national initiative called um, e Digital Egypt Youth Initiative that's under the auspices of the Prime Minister of Egypt. Uh, and the, the, the platform is accessible to PWDs. Um, and uh, we are providing some of uh, free training uh, when we have funds, of course. Um, and recently we did some, some training with Amazon and uh, with Cisco. But actually on the long term, if we do not have fund, the, the, the platform will not really uh, be as effective as it should be. So I'm wondering what uh, the, the, the network can provide us. How, how can it support in such cases? Thank you. Thank you so much, a very concrete question, and hopefully we can have some concrete answers. Can I turn to the panelists and perhaps maybe ITU or UNDP, Rob, Doreen, might want to kick us, kick us off? You think, can I, so can I jump in and, yes. and I'm gonna throw it to, to Robert because I was actually thinking that uh, our joint facility that he referenced is perhaps the answer to the question by putting together this joint facility, which pools ITU, uh, UNDP, and other resources, it's intended to actually support countries, in particular, the resident coordinators. If they have a request, they can come to us, and then using this joint facility, we can help support them um, with less 
budgetary challenges, but I'd ask Robert to perhaps uh, supplement if I can pass to him. Yeah, no, thanks, uh, Doreen, and thanks for the question. I think um, this is exactly what you said, Doreen, but also to pull something from what Chris was saying about uh, in the chat about making sure that we make use of existing capacities first. So I think the first port of call for, for the multi-stakeholder network would be to look at Okay, who's got you know Arab language skills? Who has got capacity to work with youth? Who can you know the the kinds of things that are being looked for? Um, and then if there are existing capacities that are that can be made available, that's great. Um, if but if there are not, and we identify a gap, then that's something that poss possibly can be done by, for example, the joint facility, or finding another partner who might be able to step into that gap without kind of an existing um, service there. So I think it's a it's a combination of those things together. Thank you so much, Rob. Um, can I see if there's anybody else in the room here who might like to? Um, I see a gentleman. Hi, uh, my name is Asim Adil, and I work for GIZ. Uh, uh, I don't have a question. I just wanted to refer back to your question. Uh, as John, uh, Bian Rector was there. So a Tengi platform also is a good learning management uh, solution. And there are a lot of courses available which GIZ is already focusing on Africa. Thank you. If we could turn to Bjorn. Yes, <clears throat> thanks. thanks a lot um, for the for the question and maybe also to link this to the um, colleague from Egypt, we do have a digital uh, governance program in Egypt um, um, and that could be something um, we could have a look into. I don't know the detail of the platform, but um, from our experiences, one has to look beyond the platform, but rather, you know, what is the issue and how uh, existing platforms can be reused, you know, um, advocating one of the dial digital principles, you know, because the sustainable of an individual platform is, um, from our experience is rather unique and needs to be then then see how, how we could recycle uh, or re reuse already existing uh, materials for the thing you want to need but yes um, 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 the GZ colleagues in, in Egypt uh, could come in handy when it comes to the um, the Atingi platform uh, we we work with online uh, but also blended learning uh, um, so uh, online only there are um, tutors and there are um, uh, web-based trainings um, that also get certificates online only. Um, and when it comes to blended learning, we link this to our so-called digital transformation centers or the partners like UNICEF or um, uh, Yuma using the platform um, and then endorsing this, uh, the platform with offline certificates. So um, that's absolutely enshrined, um, but um, that depends to what kind of courses uh, you're looking for. We currently have around 400 courses on the platform and some have agriculture background, some have digital background. It depends, again, it's a platform and it depends what Kind of target group you want to look into but then nothing comes uh, uh, with an un, un, uh, unguided uh, system but uh, quite often with an online only uh, manual because we believe this is something um, particularly in the COVID times that, that can, can make a difference in rural areas where we believe there's the most uh, effects of this kind of platforms and yes there's also a link to um, uh, access opportunities to offline services uh, that the platform is providing with raspberry Pi and other technical gadgets um, that brings us um, to already underserved uh, uh, communities. Thank you. Um, I believe Chris might want to say something and then Rob very quickly before we turn to a question online from Maylin. Uh, great. Yeah, no, I, I think the the more targeted approach is exactly what we're, we are trying to do with um, the demand-driven approach and more regional focus. So one of our projects is uh, a project, a big project we're doing in Africa uh, with the AU, the African Union. And, and it really is looking at local needs, figuring out what's there. Also thinking about uh, knowledge modules that could be, if someone else had a digital public good that could be used for others in creating those. Um, and the regional efforts, which we're trying to do in jointly with the Organization of American States, with ASEAN and others are important as well. And, and, and we're also trying to build some hubs around the world, like in the Pacific Island area. 
So, so it is important to both have that global approach where people can share the information, but also the, the local and regional approach because the needs may be different, the, the realities may be different and, and tying those together is important. And I know Robert and his, uh, and his you know, what UNDP does, UNDP does is very attuned to that more local feeding larger effort. Uh, so appreciate that. Rob. Yeah, uh, Yuping, I apologize for asking for the floor again, but I just wanted to make a point that perhaps I should have done up front, but it's it's about the discoverability issue, right? And every time we met with the roundtable, um, you discover more and more things that are out there. And so what another reason to have the network is to just, you know, it's not to duplicate, it's not to overlap, it's, it's really meant to kind of network, <laughs> literally, about try to get people to be able to find a way to navigate to things that are already there because it is so hard and digital moves so fast that it's it, it's hard to keep track and so hopefully we're start starting to create with all the partners here a kind of a resource networked approach where you can lead and navigate to those areas thanks because we're running out of time and we're going to go very quickly and read out mail-in phone from pci's question about how we get role models like bangladesh out there. And that's an opportunity for Anir to come in very quickly. I understand that he wants to say something. Anir? And then Keith, uh, uh, one sure, line. I was going to, thank you, Pink. Uh, I was going to actually uh, mention something that UNDP has started working on uh, to create uh, open source uh, training content for, for civil service based on something that the New York University of Lab has actually produced. And uh, the GovLab team uh, with uh, Professor Beth Novak and uh, others actually put something quite interesting. It focused on solving public problems. There is a digitization aspect to it, but it's really about how you look at a problem, and how you partner with the private sector, how you create evidence, uh, how you understand the citizen needs and then develop content. So that, that was quite interesting. The discussion I think that's going on at UNDP is to take that and globalize it uh, in, in many different languages and different contexts, so actually localize it also. I'm going to point, point that out. In the case of Bangladesh, uh, we are very interested in looking at that problem and use it in our context. But if I may just take 30 seconds to, uh, to say what we have done in Bangladesh. Again, a lot of support and guidance from UNDP and IT over the years, but a lot of uh, failing and learning from failures. Uh, in Bangladesh, deliberately. Our prime minister has given us that sort of freedom to fail and learn from that. I think that political will, I think a lot of uh, the, the panelists talked about, that political will is actually important. That you try out, uh, learn from mistakes, and then quickly move on to a higher plane and then build, build on that. So that actually develops confidence. Sometimes what happens is what we started in the beginning was to try to copy from South Korea and Singapore when we started out in seven and eight. And, yeah. and that failed. So we started learning from our own failures. Just yeah. wanted to point that out. Thank, Thank you. you so much. And Kate. Thanks so much. And uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to have a uh, last word. Um, I wanted to talk about both answer that question, but also tie to what Anir was talking about, which is the concept of peer learning, which both Maylin and I put into the chat um, and something I neglected to, to mention. I cannot overemphasize the number of times that we have seen countries actually learn best from one another. Um, we have great examples in terms of Smart Africa's Digital Economy Working Group. Um, we have uh, examples in terms of ADLI, which is the African D Data Leadership Initiative, which is bringing together countries. We have great examples in Asia of the Asia eHealth Informatics Network, where 27 countries are sort of charting their journey to universal health coverage and the digital information systems that tie together. And I think the more that we can incorporate that into capacity building, um, the better off everyone will be. As Maylin puts in, this is a common practice in terms of tech, um, and I would love to actually see us expand and actually invest in that to the extent, I mean, to the depth to which it actually deserves is a great way to drive digital transformation. Thanks. Thank you so much, Kate. And thank you so much, all panelists, and questions from the floor. We now have a video from the Assistant Secretary General of the Office of Information and Communications Technology here at the United Nations, Mr. Bernardo Mariano Jr., after which we will have closing remarks from the Assistant Secretary General. Can we have the video, please?
Oops. It doesn't seem that there's sound under the video. Let's try that again. The sound is very, uh, is a bit soft on this video. So please go ahead and turn your uh, earphones right up. All right, we will start that again to be able to give him the, the full attention he deserves. The time's the charm. <laughs> exactly. I think this is the lesson of what happens if you go over your time. Otherwise, we'll try to upload it so that you can all view it later. All right. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to be able to address you today. But first of all, I would like to commend the Office of the Secretary General's Envoy on Technology, the International Telecommunication Union, and the United Nations Development Program for convening this important roundtable on the launch of the multi-stakeholder network for digital capacity building. This multi-stakeholder network, which is part of the implementation of the Secretary General Roadmap for Digital Cooperation, will be a critical mechanism to help us better coordinate, scale the UN system digital capacity support. This multi-stakeholder network process will also help to contribute to ongoing work towards the digital compact, as proposed by the Secretary General recent, and I quote, our common agenda, end of quote. My office, the United Nations Office of Information and Communication Technology, is committed to support the Secretary General Roadmap for Digital Cooperation and the multi-stakeholder network through various initiatives that are aiming at strengthening our role of technology provision enabler and orchestrator for multiple UN entities. As well as being responsible for technology support to the Secretary General Data Strategy, my office, in cooperation with the Secretary General's Envoy on Technology, establishing an open source program. In fact, in a world that is complex, hyper-connected and dynamic, we cannot go about doing business as usual. The UN Charter principles of equality, unity, collaboration, inclusivity and respect of diversity embodies a strong drive towards open source culture in our organization and in our member states. The open source initiative will further contribute the support the open source heroes, wherever they are, whoever they are, and orchestrate a concrete open source technology adoption. The open source program is being designed to be the center of the UN open source operations and the enabler of the UN technology teams to build and configure software artifacts as digital public goods for universal use. I hope that we will have a very fruitful, fruitful and stimulating discussions today. And it is my sincere wish that today's roundtable will spur both actions and partnerships to ensure that through this work, the network of stakeholders will contribute in accelerating progress towards sustainable development goals. My office is ready to engage and support your digital transformation work. I thank you. Thank you, Bernardo. And for closing words now, and with thanks to everyone and our stellar panelists and all of you for being here today, Assistant Secretary General to close the meeting. 
just a few words. I would like to say, first of all, thank you, of course, to all of you. And in particular, that I'm very encouraged by the concrete examples I've heard from all our roadmap partners who are contributing. The aim, as we all understand, is bridging the digital divide. Now, the second point is, of course, this is not the only way. This is a tool. This is a network. This is a, a useful in starting point to know what's out there and to match what uh, the demand and the offer can be. I would say maybe less elegantly than uh, Rob already said, he said we, it helps us to navigate. I would say it also helps us to avoid reinventing the wheel. There are programs out there. There are many, many informations uh, that you can find on this uh, network, on this clearing house. If, if you take the, the time to uh, you know, navigate it and, uh, and find what you need, if it is already available, you will have spared yourself a lot of uh, uh, other time you would need to build a new program which does exactly the same thing which is already available in, through this clearing house. And third and last point, I really renew the invite to other service providers uh, to join uh, this platform with their uh, letting us know and, and um, adding their CB initiatives, because the more this platform is rich and updated, the best it will serve its purpose for all the users. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. And thank you so much to the technical team for allowing us to go a little bit over because it's such an important discussion. Good night from Poland, and thank you again.